You may be surprised to learn that uh, one question we're trying to help Margo, our three-year-old Margo, answer is, when is it right to shout? Under, uh, under a lot of circumstances, it is not right to shout. Uh, it's not good to yell at people. We end up saying that pretty frequently, especially late at night and early in the morning. We, we do not yell at each other. But it is important to note, and I want her to know, that there are times when one needs to shout. There are times when it's not only okay, but required that we raise our voices. It's right to raise our voices under certain circumstances. It's right to raise our voices when people need to hear us, but either can't or won't. We might say the same thing about the prophets. The text for today is Amos 5. Why would anyone need a prophet? It's the same sort of question as why would anyone need to shout? Why do prophets need to speak? When we already have texts, commands, rules, systems of justice to take care of problems, missteps, and mistakes, why do we need prophets to speak? Prophetic speech, much like a good shout, is needed when normal modes of speech aren't working. When the texts and rules and commands won't do, or aren't doing any good. Prophetic speech is most needed where it's least welcome. We all like prophecy when it's aimed at somebody else. The tastiest, the most succulent variety is that prophecy that's aimed at my own specific opponent, my own particular enemy. Likewise, the most annoying, the most aggravating variety of prophecy is the prophecy that's aimed at me and at mine. And the same was true in the 8th century before Christ in the northern kingdom of Israel. In the middle of the 8th century, the northern kingdom was doing very well. They're enjoying great prosperity and power. Finally, they had gained some freedom and success to live in opulence and luxury. And what's more, a prophet had arrived speaking about terrible calamities that were on the horizon for all of Israel's surrounding enemies. The prophet Amos paints a grand map with his words. He draws a circle going from city to city. All these centers of foreign power that had threatened Israel's peace and prosperity. Countries that had harmed Israel in the past. Like a whirlwind, Amos's words call down God's own wrath on them, condemning their iniquity, their sinfulness, their idolatry, their war crimes. The very start of the book, chapter 1, he says, Because they carried entire communities to hand them over to Edom, so I will send fire on the wall of Gaza, fire that shall devour its strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. The neighboring peoples are being targeted one by one by Amos's words here. The surrounding world will be consumed in a massive conflagration. Those who harmed them and who continue to threaten them will become an inferno reduced to ash. Now you can imagine the people in range of Amos's voice. They're enjoying their morning routines, sipping their tea, eating their, their morning bread fresh from the oven, cloaked in morning light. They hear a voice calling out their enemies one by one, name by name, city by city. 
the enemies of God will be shattered and crushed into dust. But hold on a second. He's named all our enemies one by one, and the spotlight of his words has been moving along the map in a circle that is shrinking, smaller and smaller, around the northern kingdom of Israel. Surely he's going to stop, though. Surely that spotlight will shine everywhere else, but not on us. But he's still going. He's showing no sign of stopping. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise, is made in Israel. Forsaken on her land with no one to raise her up. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turned justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground, the one who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out, on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash out against the strong, so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate the one who reproves in the gate. They abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built You've built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it's an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, and in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas. They shall call the farmers to mourning, and those skilled in lamentation to wailing. In all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Alas, for you who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear. Or went into the house to, and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Isn't the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings... I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What? is all this shouting about? What is this message that's not getting across with the regular speech, with all of the texts and commands and rules and practices that they already have? What is it that they're not really listening to? What we have here is a people who are performing all the right acts of worship in all the right sorts of ways. So what could be the problem? 
Well, there's something that keeps coming up. There's some shady stuff going on at the gate. Amos says they, they hate the one who reproves at the gate, who criticizes, who corrects, who challenges them at the gate, instead of establishing justice in the gate. They take bribes and push aside the needy at the gate. What in the world does that mean? This is one reason why context is so important. This is not just any gate. The gate in this context is the public court, the place where communal judgments are rendered, where conflict is resolved, where legal proceedings take place. The gate is one of the linchpins for the common good, binding the community together, establishing a sense of fairness and balance and structure for the community, for the whole community. And at this gate, the poor are being sold for a pair of sandals. Those with nothing are being pushed aside while bribes are being taken. And the wealthy are not only not providing for the poor as the law prescribes and as God demands of them, they're making their poverty even worse. They're pressing and grinding them down further and further into the dust, bringing righteousness to the ground, as Amos says. But there's more to this story. These are not just any people. These are the people who worship God, who've entered into a covenantal relationship with God, who've bound themselves with everything they are and have to the Lord. They attend all the holy days. They observe the Sabbath. They attend church wearing their Sunday best. They pray all the right prayers, sing all the right songs, declare publicly that they are the people of God. But while they do these things, while they construct this flawless facade of devotion, their true selves, their inmost hearts, burn to go out and systematically oppress those who have nothing. As it says a couple chapters later, they attend the Sabbath and the whole time they're um, practicing these holy days, they're saying, in their inmost hearts. We will make the ephah small and the shekel great. We will imbalance the scales. And not only will they oppress them economically, they will remove from them any recourse they might have legally in the only place left where these, might, where these people might seek some refuge, some hope for justice, the gate of the city, where they might hope for some judgment against those who imbalance the scales. They're trampled on. They're pushed aside. Any possibility they have of moving out of their poverty is erased. Now, there's a, just a couple of things that I want to highlight here. One is that there's a connection between worship and justice. It's a connection that was lost on the people that Amos was talking to here. We have a small group of powerful and massively wealthy people claiming to be the people of God, saying all the right things, going to church every time the doors are open, even observing the fasts. And yet underneath that veil, we see there's something else hiding. Underneath, underneath those shells are people who view those with less than themselves, not as equals, certainly not as opportunities to show God's love, but simply as instruments for their own gain. And Amos is pointing out not just their injustice, but their hypocrisy. He's pointing to the disjunction, the disjointedness between their worship of God and their real lives. One of the most important points Amos is making here is that there's meant to be a connection, a fit, a consistency between our worship and the rest of our lives. In fact, it goes deeper than that. Worship involves an actual union with the one worshipped. And that union has a transformative impact. We're shaped and directed and reoriented by whatever we unite with, by whatever we worship. To worship something is to say, this is worthy of my absolute and total devotion. This object of my worship is the very definition of goodness and truth and wholeness. So, if we worship a God who's defined by gracious love, 
then it follows that we are declaring that gracious love is what real goodness and wholeness look like. That this is something worthy of orienting our whole lives around. For the people of God to say this when they come together to worship, and then to live their lives filled with apathy or malice toward those without power or privilege. It's like a body trying to function and live with all its limbs out of joint. The people Amos is talking to here are living lives out of joint with their supposed worship and faith. And this book calls us, too, to consider that same possibility. The possibility that even if we give lip service to faith and devotion, we might still be living lives defined by apathy or outright malice toward those who were called to be serving and loving. One other thing, although I, I hate to tell Margot this, sometimes it's a good thing to shout. And there are two sides to this. The people of God are called to have eyes that can see past their own interests, to see as God sees, so that we can love as God loves. And this means not just loving the neighbor right next to us, but making sure as best we can that we build a system that takes care of all the neighbors, everyone's neighbors, the ones nearby and the ones far away. And sometimes this means calling out, raising our voices, as Amos has done, to those who don't want to hear a voice of reproof, who don't want to hear the truth. The other side of that coin is that we have to recognize our own sinfulness, our own resistance to the voices that call us out on the carpet. When we hear a raised voice, not to just cover our ears and shout them down, but to listen and see if we've been deaf to something God wants us to hear. Let's pray together. God, we praise your name. You are the Holy One. We pray that you would fill us with your Spirit, that you would melt us down and reshape us more and more into the image of your Son. Pray that you would transform our minds and our hearts, that we may understand and love as you understand and love. Pray that you would transform our eyes and our ears, that we could see and hear our own lives and the lives around us as you see them. We pray that you would empower us with your spirit to live out our calling throughout our lives. We thank you for the mercy that you show us, for your transforming love. We pray all things through Christ our Lord. Amen.